So we're joined on the same. Trek, yes. First Ger was it Gary the, the pilot. Gary the pilot. was Gary was in the pilot for yeah. Star Trek that sold the series. He oh. was the guest star. Wow. What was it like wearing them contact lenses? Oh, you saw it. Yeah. Is this working? No. No. We are a mic down. Gary Lockwood. Try it again. Try it again, Gary. Try it again. No, we are still down. Well, we can it's on. We can share. Okay, that's it. Yeah. You'll have to share, I'm afraid. Sorry, Gary. Yeah. I do apologize for that. Well, so that's all right, mate. You owe me five pounds. That's it. Five pounds? I'll get it yeah. out for you right now. <laughs> yeah, I did the pilot. Yeah, and so... I, my agent, when, I'm, when I don't have a good mic, he's my agent. Oh, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like wearing them contact lenses? Those silver contact lenses. I bet they were uncomfortable in that pilot episode. Uh, I've enjoyed signing on it, but worst job I ever had. Yeah. I did the whole job blind, yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't any good-looking chicks, so it didn't matter. No, so it was just basically put them in, walk around blind, and just yeah. act, act your socks off. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. So I watched 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time a couple of days ago. I was just telling Kia. Um, totally blown away. What a powerful film. Uh, for me, I like Star Trek, Star Wars. Uh, I like the sci-fi genre in itself. And for me, it rounded off my sci-fi genre. Um, Keir said as well to watch it in a bigger screen, and I totally agree with that. I'd love to see that in IMAX. Um, tell us about that experience that you've just told me about, about the orchestra. Well, uh, about three weeks ago, I had the experience. I, um, for, I should tell you first that they have a special print of 2001 where all the music has been removed so that it can be shown with a live symphony orchestra playing all the music. The London Symphony Orchestra did it, the New York Philharmonic oh. did it, and I, just, I was never av uh, available to go, yeah. but the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra also did it with a huge screen. It blew me away. It was like I had never seen the film before. To hear a live, brilliant orchestra playing that music and a 200 member chorus doing, I never realized that the music in the end, that weird music, yeah. a lot of that is chorale. I never knew that until I saw this experience, had this experience. It's a haunting it sound. Yeah. It really yeah. is absolutely haunting. Um, so, that, I mean, for a film that was brought out in 1968, it, to me, it was, it, you know, watching, like I said, two days ago, it's still, it, it's so relevant now. You know, um, how did you both land the roles on, on getting, getting your roles for 2001 A Space Odyssey? Well, he has his own story. Mine was, my agent called and he said, um, Stanley Kubrick wants you to star, co-star in his new film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I swear to God, I was a giant Kubrick fan. Yeah. I won't get into that too much. We don't have a lot of time. But um, I said to my agent, I said, wow, what's it going to cost me? <laughs> I, was, um, I was doing a film in London with Laurence Olivier called Bunny Lake is Missing. And I had the day, I, uh, one day I came home from work, from filming, and my wife said, call your agent. Yeah. So I called my agent, and he said, are you sitting down? I said, no, why? He said, you better sit down. I said, why? You've just been offered the lead in Stanley Kubrick's next film. I, oh. had no, I didn't audition. I never met him. I had no idea that I was in the running. <laughs> yeah. It was completely out of the blue. Wow. But now, he had screened some of my films, yeah. but it was extraordinary. And I'll just add to that, uh, they used to have a fun fair in... Uh, right up by the river, I can't think the name of the, the, the location in London where they had this fun fair in the river. Yeah. And they had a, a, a fortune teller who read your palms. And I went in to have my, I never had my palm read. And he said, are you a, an engineer? I said, no. He said, are you, a, are you a teacher? Do you teach science? Yeah. I said, no. Well, see, and this is, by the way, this is before I knew that I had the film. Yeah. He said, well, I don't know, but I see a rocket ship in your palm. That's wow. a true story. Creepy. Yeah. Wow. 
So how did you both fit? How yeah. Go on. So don't, you don't think that's just a matter of grave coincidence? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I don't <laughs> believe in that. <laughs> no? You don't no, believe in anything I, like that? No. No? No, I just wanted to say that. No, that's okay. <laughs> so what was your question? My question is, how did you both feel when, when you got the scripts? Uh, what was your feelings after reading that script? Well, I tell you, when I read the script, something was vaguely familiar. Yeah. When I was a, a oh, a early teenager, 12, 13, 14 years old, I was a real science fiction fan. Yeah. I wasn't, but when I made Space Odyssey particularly, but yeah. And I subscribed to all the major magazines, Galaxy Science Fiction, Astounding Science Fiction. Yeah. I and my mom would give me. Uh, an anthology of the best science fiction of 1950, whatever, 1951, 1952, and I read a short story. I suddenly remembered reading the short story that Arthur C. Clarke, C. Clarke yeah. wrote yeah. called The Sentinel, yeah. which was the short story that Kubrick decided to make this film from. Yeah. Of course, he expanded it, became a, but it, I had read this, and so I said, wow. <laughs> What should I add to that? How did you feel? What was the emotions you went through? So you read the script, you sat there, and you sat back and you thought, what was them thoughts? Okay, very candidly, um, I w Kubrick was the smartest man I think I had ever worked for, and I knew his films at that point explicitly. Yeah. And uh, all I can tell you is that I had seen Dr. Strangelove, I'd seen The Killing, I had seen Paz of Glory, which is, in fact, I'll tell you a fast story about Paz of Glory. Cool. I was a football player at UCLA, and in, in California, we have what they call the devil winds. And the winds come out of the desert. I was an English major, though, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, listen, it's kind of funny. And they had these devil winds, and they come out of the desert, and football practice, getting ready for the season is just hell on earth. I mean, you know, you get a free education, but they just work you to death. And I hated it. I hated it so much. But free education. So I got up in the morning. I got the LA Times, and I used to like movies a lot. And I opened it up, and there's Pass of Glory. And when I had seen the movie The Killing, it was the first time in my life. Now, Kier grew up in New York City, which is much more hip. I grew up on a ranch in California, so there wasn't anybody to talk films about or two with, or with and. So anyway, yeah. I came out of the killing and it's the first time I ever stopped and walked over to see the poster in the, in the lobby. Yeah. And I, I, the reason I did that, I was an artist. I won a national paint contest when I was a kid. And I, I seen the killing and I looked at it and I said, who in the hell made this? You know, you either yeah. have an eye for art or you don't. I mean, yeah. it's not something you acquire, but, uh, and it said Stanley Kubrick, directed by Stanley Kubrick. So that day, with the devil winds coming, I got up, I, I, I lived on the beach in Malibu, and I opened up my newspaper and saw Stanley Kubrick's new movie, Paths of Glory. And I think that's your favorite Kubrick picture, isn't it? Yep. Paths of Glory is my favorite Kubrick yeah. film. I was in drama school okay. and I had the day off and somebody said, hey, there's this film playing at the local movie theater. It's a war picture yeah. with Kirk Douglas. And I said, oh, I like Kirk Douglas. Yeah. So I went down, I sat there and the film began and my jaw dropped to my lap. And the first thing I had to do when I left the theater was go to look at the poster to see who had directed this extraordinary film. Yeah. Yeah, it was Stanley Kubrick. So my, my introduction to Stanley Cooper was very much like, like right. Eric's. Yeah, wow. So both introduced basically at the same time to his films. Absolutely. It, the proof is in the pudding, you know. In other yeah. words, you taste the pudding and you say, ah, that's, that's lovely. Yeah. When you see a Kubrick film, you don't know why you like it necessarily. And some people don't quite get it at first. It takes a little bit of time. And then later... I can say this to you about 2001. In America right now, there is a new um, edition of Time magazine. Yeah. And it's all about artificial intelligence. And I just read, it, read the magazine here the other night, and I was 
my wife and I are like to read, and we're, she's reading a book, and I read the Time magazine. I read the whole thing about three or four hours. And when it was all over, I said to my wife, who was not really into sci-fi, yeah. and I said, you know, and re reading this thing about artificial intelligence makes 2001 way more relevant now than it was when it came out. Yeah. And I know it sounds exactly. a little weird, but you, you go, I mean, we, we, just, we just elected a president who talks about he's going to bring the jobs back and all this. I mean, it's such nonsense. Jobs are being lost to computer chips and cards. There are no jobs. You know what I'm saying? There are no jobs. I mean, technology is, is, is coming in. And if you see 2001 and you really look at the sort of existential delivery and, and message of the film, you'll hell, know a hell of a lot about where Kubrick's brain was. Brilliant. So did you do any kind of research? When you got the roles, you read the script, did you do any research into your roles as astronauts? Did you, did you know of any astronauts? No, but um, we had some rehearsal. Um, Stanley had these uh, fictional bios yeah. of the of the two characters. Okay. Explaining our background, how in the year two thousand and one, by the by by the by the time that you two thousand would come around, yeah. that their way of choosing the people that would become astronauts were people that showed that they had a particular calm psychological profile that they were the kind of people that wouldn't be too excited when yeah. they, when the emergencies would take place and maybe be we, we had double doctorates in certain scientific uh, specialties i don't remember what they were yeah. now so it, there was a lot of information and um we just played the roles with that information yeah. as a background so when you're on set, did, did Stanley bring anything to you on set that was not said before to kind of bring more maybe emotion out in your, in your character or take your character into a different direction? Well, I, you know, the interesting thing is that um, the character that had the most emotion was Hal. Yeah. Uh, and and in, a, in a way, our two characters, some people have described as being more machine-like. And I think that the reason for that is, is that when you watch the film, at least the part that we're in, when, when it begins, yeah. we've been in space for months. Yeah. This is yeah. a long... And I'll, everything's been talked out by then. You yeah. know, we've, we've, there's, not, there's not a lot more to be said. And it's just the mundane, day-to-day -day stuff that we're supposed to do as part of being the, the two live... The, not by alive, sh I should say the two awake. Yeah. The, the other astronauts... Are in deep hibernation. Yeah. So, we're just going through these kind of everyday motions. Why? Yeah. That's and still things begin to happen because of how. Yeah. That was. That's why there's so little emotion. That nothing really happens until how goes nuts. Well, I had some actor pals I used to play poker with, and some of them were pretty famous. I mean, Rod Steiger and people like that, I mean, really talented people, and, and, and very few older actors than my, I was about 30, I guess, when it came out, but I'm now damn near 80, but the point that I'm trying to make is I would, I went to my poker game, and all the, my actor buddies who were older than me all said, we saw your movie, and we didn't like it, and I said, well, what didn't you like, and they said, well, I mean, you know, what's this, in this computer, and he, and then, you know, I mean, it would, it's typical Kubrick, you know, it's cold and it's not heartfelt. And I said, well, what the hell do you expect? I mean, you know, it's a sci-fi movie. But if you look at the film now, I, I challenge you to look at it in a big screen, not on one of your little iPhones. And, and, and sit back and just take the trip. Don't get uptight. Don't, you're not going to be doing MTV, you know, bam, 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 bam. It just sits there and start really looking at this movie. And then if you have a big enough screen and your pristine print, which we've been yeah. privy to see lately, you'll get the picture right away. I mean, it's there and it will never ever be less than what it is. That's, that's my final word. So we've got time for one more question. Um, basically the ending for me, as I've said to Keir, it, it, um, it baffled me and it's, it's given me stuff to think about. In, kind of in your own 
like view. Um, could you tell us what the meaning of the end of the film is? Well, you know, the, um, the marvelous thing about, I think Stanley's intention was never to pinpoint exactly, it's, it's the, the monolith in a way is a metaphor for change and it has to do with uh, an evolutionary change uh, caused, in a sense, by a passing alien intelligence yeah. millions of years ahead of us in technology. And the monolith serves as a teaching machine yeah. to the apes who discover the first weapon. Yeah. And it functions in many different ways. And in a way, if you think about where this suddenly you, you jump to 2001 and then my character in a sense grows old in this strange yeah. room yeah. and then evolves into the next step, presumably. Yeah. This is my own interpretation. Go ahead. I would like you, if you ever see the movie again, which you, you may not, you've heard us talk about it, you'll notice that the moon child looks very much like Kira. I mean, he, he there's a resemblance. And so, is he going back to Earth to bring new intelligence? Maybe. Yeah. You know, the yeah. interesting thing is, if you read the book, 2001 A Space Odyssey, that was written by Arthur C. Clarke with the help of Stanley Kubrick, it's much more specific than the film about certain things. For okay. example, the fetus that I become at the very end of the film, yeah. he suggests is able to nullify the atomic weapons that both the United States and the USSR have in constant orbit oh. around the Earth. It's not in the film, but it is in the book. Look. Wow, well, thanks a lot, Kira. I feel better about that yeah, right that's now. It. <laughs> although, although we now have to deal with a guy named Trump. So I'm, yeah. I'm sorry about that, Europe, but it's just, I, you know, I'm from California, he's from New York. We didn't vote for them, Guy, but, you know, we have to live with it. So I just want you to not look upon us as alien yanks, you know? <laughs> well, to be quite fair, that's all that we have time for on this stage. I could, I've got so many questions I could have asked you. Um, we've kind of run out of time. Um, thank you very much to Gary Lockwood and Kid Delay, everyone. Um, if you'd like to stay there, gents, thank you very much for you guys at home for watching. Um, Please remember to like and subscribe to our channel and remember to press that notification button. We are going to be back with Sam Jones himself, Flash Gordon. Again, Gary Lockwood and Keir Delay. Thank you very much, guys.